Welcome back to the channel and in this video we're going to talk about disk selection for NAS because a common question is should I use enterprise disk or NAS specific disk for my NAS or network attached storage. I run multiple Synology NASs and I've used them for about eight years now. Back then when I started I used Western Digital Red Disks but I stopped using WD. I looked for alternatives and there were a few choices that stood out but the thing that isn't clear specifically are the choice of using either enterprise disk or using the NAS specific disk especially if enterprise disks are actually cheaper for storage density and this is true of Seagate disks right now and it actually has been for a while. I'm going to share why I moved away from Western Digital also because it was important for me when choosing the disks I would use going forward. Going back to around 2005 I was at the time impressed with WD's disk storage density development and reliability but three major things happened that made me decide to drop them. Firstly WD started to drop behind in terms of disk density and capacity and at the time Seagate was starting to make great strides in terms of that disk capacity. This challenge could have been one of the reasons why WD made some of the decisions that I'm going to come to. Secondly, going back some years I had been actually a huge Seagate fan but they also went through a phase when I wasn't so impressed with their reliability and that's when I'd moved away to WD. But now Seagate seemed to be doing a much better job in terms of disk reliability and quality than they had been recently as well as leading the way in terms of capacity and price to capacity ratios. But the real kicker for me was what happened with WD and their use of SMR drives or shingle magnetic recording technology on their NAS drives and ultimately this was the deciding factor for me. To give you some background there are a number of technologies that disk manufacturers have used to increase data density. Since around the mid 2000s this has been done primarily using something called PMR or perpendicular magnetic recording and this is also known as CMR or conventional magnetic recording. This technology simply places disk tracks next to each other on the disk platters and writing the magnetic polarity into the recording layer perpendicular to the right head. The innovation for increased capacity here was really just increasing platter counts in the disk and also increasing aerial density by making these tracks and right heads smaller. But this was running into limiting factors around how small these tracks could really be. One way to overcome this was to use something called shingle magnetic recording and with this approach the tracks partially overlap and this means that the size of the right heads and the granularity of the writing doesn't need to be so small. So this is fine but it means that as you write data you're actually partially overwriting data on neighbouring tracks and you need to go and rewrite that data on those tracks that may have been overwritten. So this does have an impact to sustained write performance. If you want to write one megabyte of data you may need to rewrite several other megabytes on those neighbouring tracks to retain data consistency and stability. This could have a particularly bad impact on very large writes especially things like large RAID rebuilds. If your writes are fairly small and not continuous then this doesn't have a serious impact so it's a good technology for smaller writes and lower frequencies to reduce cost. You can mitigate the limitations of SMR by using larger disk caches. Now as data is written to disk the write performance impact can be offset by writing to the larger cache which is fast and the disk can then catch up from the cache. However if you're performing a lot of large writes then the cache will fill and then you will have delays on IO to the disk as it performs these rewrites and you get lower performance. And this is why these types of disks are less suitable for NAS use cases where large files are being written often. But the use of SMR wasn't the reason I stopped using WD specifically. I could have just stopped using those disks but the reason was that WD went to great lengths to actively hide this from customers. Not only was it not documented but if you went looking and asking the right questions you couldn't easily find out which disks had CMR and which had SMR. They basically went to significant effort to hide what they were doing, presumably so they could keep up with the price to capacity of their competitors. I originally used CMR Western Digital Red 6TB disks at the time in my Synology DS2415 Plus NAS but they replaced these disks with SMR versions quietly and the only way I could identify which disks were SMR was by looking at the cache size. The CMR drives had the part number WD60 EFRX and this has 64 megs of cache and the SMR drives were WD60 EFAX and they had 256 meg. So on face value the larger cache makes them look like better drives but that cache was there to mitigate the limitations of SMR write performance. Eventually, and it really did take too long, WD were called out on this very publicly and they got a great deal of customer backlash. This resulted in them keeping the WD Red range and using SMR and then creating a WD Red Plus range and using CMR technology. I actually tested one of these plus drives but due to changes in firmware I wasn't even able to use the disk it just wasn't recognised by my NAS. This may have been fixed by now but having to send this disk back and all the previous problems this is when I decided that I was done with WD at this point. Now would I go back to WD? Yes I would. 
but they really need to do some work to catch up on their price capacity and also there's definitely some trust that needs to be rebuilt. And honestly, my experience with the Western Digital Red range has been really good. This six terabyte disc, for example, has been running for nearly eight years. But getting back to SMR discs more broadly, if you're using a NAS actively, especially if it's a larger model using RAID 5, SHR or some other parity type, then I would avoid using SMR discs entirely. So, SMR aside, which disc to use? Let's look at the Seagate options and compare because Seagate now stands out as an excellent choice for NAS discs. So, feature-wise, there doesn't seem to be a lot to separate the IronWolf Pro versus the Exos. There is reporting that both the Pro and the Exos are noisier drives, but the status specifications, at least, don't seem to bear that out. I also run two 12-bay NASs in my office with both Pro discs and Exos, and I haven't noticed an issue in noise. There is a slight increase in power consumption from the IronWolf to the IronWolf Pro and Exos, but it isn't exceptional. The Exos also doesn't have a stated recommendation for max drives per enclosure, and this is most likely because it's an enterprise drive and designed to be placed in very large enclosures with large numbers of discs. This bay count number actually comes from how the drives detect and manage vibration. They can adjust their speed slightly so that they don't get into a harmonic resonance with other drives in the same enclosure, which can cause vibrational wear. ProDisc is able to do this for any reasonable home or SMB enclosure, but 12-bay enclosures like the DS2419 may not be ideal for the IronWolf. Though my Synology 12-bay NAS has run 6TB Western Digital Reds for many years which have a similar limitation and I haven't had any problems. And in fact, many of those now have lasted 6 or 7 years. The fact the enclosure has dampening mounts on the drive bays likely helps with reducing vibrations passing through the chassis. So, now we've established where each product sits feature-wise, let's review how these compare from a cost perspective. And I looked at costs in the UK using scan.co.uk and in the US using Newegg and there's a similar theme in both locations and I've also looked at other retailers as well and see similar results. First of all, we see that the IronWolf range does not cater to the larger disc size, so if you're looking for greater density, you may be limited to either the Pro or Exos ranges. Secondly, we see that it varies by range and in fact may vary over time periods where the best price per terabyte is. Typically, what you will see though is that smaller form factor drives will drop in price towards a floor and not maintain cost per terabyte parity. This is partly as there's a baseline cost to platform manufacturing, QA shipping and distribution etc. But also these discs will get less manufacturing capacity over time and will likely only be selling to those that are looking for a like-like -like replacement. So smaller capacity drives typically carry a premium. We also see that the higher density drives start out with a large premium and then as volume and yield increases they will drop in price. So the best cost price per terabyte often sits in the middle to the middle upper of the range. It is worth considering, however, that there is a cost associated with the slot in the NAS itself. So all NASs, regardless of size, they have a certain number of bays. So filling them with the largest possible drives give the best capacity to price for the NAS system itself. So if a larger disk has a cost per terabyte in a similar order to the smaller disk, so it may still be effectively cheaper to use that larger disk and maximize on NAS capacity. Okay, let's focus on the Pro Disc versus the Exos Discs here. We see that despite having a general feature advantage of the Pro Discs, the Exos drives are actually cheaper per terabyte across nearly the entire range. The reasons for this may be many and they may change over time, but this can include economies of scale for manufacturing quantity, simpler or cheaper distribution due to volume and margins, or excess in stock capacity at a given time. If they have a lot of these drives sitting on the shelf, they may be willing to sell them at a reduced price to get them moving. And finally, the important consideration is compatibility. Talking specifically about the Synology lineup, but this applies to others, they publish a list of supported drive models. Just because a drive isn't on the list doesn't mean it won't work, but rather that it hasn't been tested and validated by the vendor. This also means that newer drives are more likely to be missing from the list as it takes some time to resource and perform that testing. So for example, at time of creating this video, the Exos 72, 78 and the X10, X12, X14 and X16 drive ranges are supported, but nothing above 14 terabytes is actually on the list for either the 2415 Plus or the 2422 which I use. However, I run X18, 18 terabyte drives in my Synology 2415 just fine and that NAS is nearly 8 years old. You may need to be running a decent release of the NAS OS however, that is possible. So conclusions. As it stands today, 
there doesn't seem to be a reason not to run Exos discs versus either the Ironwolf or the Ironwolf Pro disc. The performance, warranty, scale and cost are all strongly in favour of Exos and there seems to be limited downside. The one thing I would be aware of is that comparative pricing on these drives could change in the future. It is recommended, though it's not required, to run the same disc type in your NAS to prevent performance related issues. If you start your NAS out with Exos discs and you plan to grow its capacity over time, it is possible at some later date that you need to pay a premium for these discs. However, having been monitoring this for some time, that price has not been swinging between the iWolf Pro and the Exos, so this doesn't appear to be a concern, at least in the immediate future. So personally, I will continue using Exos discs for the time being. So a big thank you for watching this to the end and please drop a like if this was interesting or helpful. Also, I would love you to subscribe if the content is useful and you want more of it in the future. Please also do give me your comments below if you have a perspective or like alternate drive options. I would also be interested on your take on what happened with WD's SMR drives or if they managed to keep that quiet enough that you were not aware. And as always, Thank you and I will see you in the next.